Thank you, Bobby and Suzanne. Thanks to all of you who are involved with the online chapter. It's my pleasure to be here tonight. This is my 30th year as a Better Investing member and uh, active in the volunteer community, as well as now uh, for the last 20 years, plus on the staff side. Uh, it's so great to see so many of you virtually tonight uh, who I've met in person uh, in my history with the organization. Uh, tonight, we're gonna be talking about dealing with stocks in the maybe zone. Uh, I'd like to remind you that this is an educational presentation. Uh, don't take anything that I say as an endorsement of any investment or any stock, uh, any uh, idea for your portfolio. Uh, we're gonna be talking in educational terms tonight. In this session, I hope to cover the question about uncertainty in you, when you're investing in stocks pursuant to the better investing uh, approach. How often are you 100% confident in any decision you make to buy a stock for your portfolio or in the decisions you make about buying or selling or holding any current stocks in your portfolio? I'll try to leave you with some key strategies for coping with uncertainty about investing, uh, about your decisions to buy, sell, or hold, and I'll leave you with four portfolio baskets that you can use to help you sort out uncertainty in your portfolio and decide on actions that you might want to take. We'll start with the basics. The, the classic system of portfolio management seems very clear cut. There are three choices for every security. All you have to do is choose one action. You buy any stock that you believe has a satisfactory future upside potential. You'll sell any stock that you believe has significant chances of declining or underperforming in the future. Or you will hold any stock that you will believe are worth holding for the upside returns and low chance of declines that you might uh, receive in your portfolio, uh, maybe. And similarly, there are two conclusions you might reach in researching uh, potential new holdings for your portfolio. One is to buy now. The price looks good, the fundamentals are strong. The other might be to not buy now. The price looks too high or the fundamentals are iffy. And when you're managing your portfolio, there are gonna be often many times that you'll find stocks that aren't immediate buys, but you might buy if the price or the fundamentals improve, maybe. And you might be interested to know that the original stock selection guide as it was developed um, about 75 years ago had three zones, buy, sell, and maybe. And SSG Plus now calls the maybe zone the hold zone. And I find that really fascinating. What is the intention of a maybe zone on the stock selection guide? Here it is on the printed stock selection guide that you can download from the Better Investing website today. And clearly that middle zone is labeled maybe. That nomenclature carried forward into the toolkit all the way through the last version, toolkit six as well. I like to think that the maybe zone is not really the same as the hold zone. And that the maybe zone acknowledges that there are different attributes that each individual might bring to an investing decision. There might be dif different dif judgment that you apply because of uh, differences in opinion about the future prospects of a company. You might make a different decision about a stock that's held in a tax or tax advantaged account um, compared to the decision that another investor might make. You might also be influenced by whether or not the gains or losses you sell, if you were selling a stock, would be short or long term. You might decide to postpone a decision, for instance, in order to capture a long term capital gains rate instead of a short term rate in your taxable accounts. You might have a different understanding of external issues affecting a company than another investor. And there might be an impact on the sale of portfolio diversification that would influence your decision one way or another. Or finally, maybe you just don't know. You're uncertain about the company or the valuation, its prospects or the future, the role that it plays in the economy if we're facing a recession or an expansion and a myriad of other factors that influence your decision. And it's true that every decision that we make involves trade-offs when we're deciding to buy or hold or sell a stock, uh, when we're researching stocks. We have to strive to find op opportunities that are driven by the tailwinds despite the headwinds. There are always headwinds, there are always tailwinds, but we like to see 
on balance, uh, more positive than negative about the companies that we're investing. And it's a huge warning sign, of course, when everything looks good about a particular stock. For many of us, that's a sure sign that we're missing something. Nothing is ever looking so attractive that it seems to be, quote, a sure bet. And while confidence leads to action, of course, when you're buying a stock, you're going to uh, uh, reach a level of confidence that will drive that action. If you're feeling uncertain, that can lead to inaction, which is the opposite of what we want to see in your portfolio. Even the holds should be an active decision, not something that is a default. And paralysis that's driven by this type of uncertainty is really detrimental to your portfolio performance. Academic research into financial behavior shows that individual investors tend to hold on to their underperformers for too long and that worsens our returns. Or we hold on to our outperformers too long, uh, worsening returns because we've fallen in love with the stock, we can't see the, the downside anymore. Or we don't buy when we should and we miss opportunities to improve returns because we just did, couldn't reach that level of certainty that allowed us to take action about a particular investment opportunity. That's why it's important to acknowledge uncertainty in the process of in investing. It's inherent, it's always going to be there, and we should all accept that we're going to be seldom, we're going to, are we going to be 100% certain about any investing decision that we make? And we want to remember that we're, our investing decisions are based on weighing all the positives and all of the negatives before we take action. So how can you resolve uncertainty about stocks in the maybe zone, wherever they might appear? Well, here are my thoughts on handling uncertainty in your portfolio. And we'll go back, we'll go back to the Oracle of Omaha, Warren Buffett, and his mentor for some guidance to kick us off on this investigation. Warren Buffett once wrote that the three most important words in investing are margin of safety. And his mentor, Benjamin Graham, wrote that we should buy stocks the way we buy groceries, not perfume. And I think that's those are good, good thinking uh, points for us to, to, to ruminate on as we're digesting our presentation tonight. But I like this concept of margin of safety. Warren elucidated on it by, by writing that you don't try to buy businesses worth $83 for $80 million. And you can think of the same thing when you're buying an individual stock. If the average PE is 18, we don't wanna try to buy it for 17 or 19 if we can, uh, if we can help it. Uh, Warren continued, you leave yourself an enormous margin. When you build a bridge, you insist it can carry 30,000 pounds, but you only drive 10,000 pound trucks across it. And that same principle works in investing. Margins of safety can be found in a number of places on your stock selection guide. And often when I talk with other longtime better investing members and we discuss our particular approach to selecting growth rates or selecting high and low expected PEs and deciding on future low prices, we find that we have different approaches but with built different margins of safety is built into different factors. And at the end of the day, our conclusions are often remarkably similar. And so for instance, if we could buy at a lower than average PE ratio, then we can limit the downside. We can limit the risk to our portfolio of rice, price declines in many cases. If we look for quality companies, companies that have above average profit margins, well, this allows us to, to offer to receive some protection uh, for that investment from competitive threats or industry-wide problems or economic downturns. We can also buy companies that have low levels of debt relative to peers or higher interest coverage, and that re reduces the risk of rising interest rates and, and the resulting lower profits that come from servicing high level of debt. And if we like dividends, then we might be looking for companies that have strong cash flow because that will support dividend growth and expansion over the time. This is some of the ways that we find margins of safety when we're investing in individual companies. But we also can find margins of safety in our entire portfolio by using practices such as diversification. By balancing our portfolio by sector and industry, we can reduce risks that come from overall economic issues and particular industry problems. 
we balance our portfolio by company sizes or by the rate of EPS growth. And that reduces the risk that underperforming markets might deliver to our portfolio, or it might decrease the overall vol volatility in our portfolio. But one new concept that I'd like you to think about is, can we also balance our holdings by confidence level? so that the average level of certainty in your portfolio still provides margin of safety. So what do we mean by that confidence level? Well, I'm thinking of confidence level as a portfolio metric and that we can look at all of our holdings. And I'm sure if you sat down with your club members and you asked them, went around the table about each company and said, how confident are you feeling about this particular stock and its projected total return from this valuation level, knowing what we know about the company. And if you asked all the club members to rate them on a one to 10 rating, you would probably come up with some median or average figures for each company that would express at the, the number 10 stocks, the highest rated for confidence, and the number one stocks, the lowest rated for uh, stocks for confidence. And then you can consider the entire portfolio. And this is an interesting way, I think, to allow members to articulate something that's not often quantifiable about the portfolio. There can, might be some discomfort that comes from holding particular stocks. In many investment clubs, you'll have meeting after meeting after meeting where members debate whether to continue holding a stock that's not living up to expectations, uh, where one member might be a strong advocate, perhaps it's the member who brought the club, stock to the club, another member might be not wanting to shake the boat too much, but has a very strong belief that it's time to sell that stock, and discussion ensues, hopefully politely, but we know that's not always the case when money's on the line. And after going through this exercise, perhaps you'll discover that you've got stocks uh, that there is a general sense uh, that there's not a lot of confidence, that there's a higher degree of uncertainty about those particular companies. Of course, you can do this with your own portfolio. It may be a little easier in some ways to have this debate uh, with yourself about the confidence levels of each stock that you own. But it's a way of raising the flag uh, about those companies for which there's particular unease you might be feeling, uh, but you just don't know what to do about that particular company. I wanted to talk about a couple of examples of dealing with uncertainty. Uh, and one of the biggest causes of uncertainty is often the impact of a sudden price decline. And this is because the market is the market. The market does what the market does. The market takes uh, a rumor and treats it like fact. It takes fact and treats it like conjecture. And there are always market players willing to second guess uh, what the reality and the likely prospects for any investment opportunity are. And so as a result, the stock's valuation is always going to reflect the impact of company weakness. But by weakness, I mean perceived problems as well as actual problems. And that creates the dilemma for individual investors, because even that slightest perception of weakness will drive down the price of a stock. And as a result, uh, simply because a stock has declined in price is not necessarily a sign of weakness. Uh, this, it can be um, a, a fear response of other investors, but it makes it deceptive if we try to interpret that price decline as indicative of fundamental problems. And it becomes very difficult to deal with this sort of uncertainty because no matter how right you are in the end, if the rest of the market refuses to accept it, then you're stuck holding a stock that nobody wants and it will take could take a very long time, often in the course of two or three years before the market seems to recognize that things weren't so terrible after all. And this is often the case with stocks that stumble um, and it's gotta be very, tricky in uh, for many investors to look for these fallen angel opportunities. That's a stock that has performed poorly. Uh, it might be a one-time issue, but the market reacts as if it's the tip of an iceberg and we just haven't seen the full scope of the problems and the market is gonna steer clear of that holding until it is proven beyond a doubt that the uh, iceberg portion that was underwater really isn't a threat whatsoever. 
and that can take two, three, four years before the market is in a position to to come back to companies that suffer those one-time short-term downturns. So I'd like to again let's sort these different types of company problems. Um, usually when companies are experiencing fundamental troubles, when they've released a quarterly report uh, that hasn't lived up to expectations, when there's been a press release that's identifying problems, when their price has fallen considerably since the start of the year, there are three categories that we can slot these into uh, or attempt to slot these types of companies into. One is the temporary problems that resolve quickly. And again, quickly is a matter of, of uh, uh, subject to different interpretation, but relatively quickly, we'll say. The number two is temporary problems that turn into permanent problems. Um, there have been plenty of examples of companies that have experienced temporary problems that lead into their businesses going bankrupt, uh, being bought out, um, and uh, causing investors to, to lose lots of money. And then there are permanent slash long-term problems that continue in perpetuity uh, and uh, it, holding on to those companies is really an exercise in perhaps collecting a dividend, uh, but not realizing uh, the fullest potential of your portfolio. Logic is certainly your friend as an investor, but experience is something that has to be earned and gained over time to really uh, experience these three different types of company situations and be able to identify them. You can make an educated guess, however, no matter what your experience level is. And if you're left with uncertainty after slotting these uh, a company to one of these three categories, the simple question it is, to ask yourself is if you can find other stocks that stimulate more confidence. And the answer to that question uh, is always, yes, there are always stocks to be purchased and considered for your portfolio that fit better investing guidelines that will offer an above average return. The, the problem is the finding them. The problem is not that they don't exist. Another concept that I've begun using in our small cap and former newsletter is to put problem stocks on probation. And I like this term because it, it, I, it, it identifies the company as having what I perceive to be temporary problems, but I'm not ruling out the, the potential for that problem to turn into a permanent problem. So these are companies that have the highest level of uncertainty uh, and for which I think it is prudent to not rush into action no matter how cheap they may appear. Um, the Better Investing suggests that stocks be sold after three to five declining quarters of weakness, uh, which I interpret as meaning three to five quarters where pre-tax profit is growing more slowly on a consistent basis or a trailing 12 month basis. Um, and so on probation stocks are meant to be held within that period uh, and then a decision made at some point where evidence becomes clear that those on probation stocks are not likely to live up to their fullest potential uh, and should be sold, or if they're on track for a long-term uh, return to their more normal uh, experience. experience. Um, another situation is those stocks uh, that are often irrationally overpriced. When we look at underperforming stocks in your in your portfolio, they often appear to be the best values. When we look at the investor advisory service or the small cap informer, look at the coverage lists, the spreadsheets that are available in each issue, and you sort them by total return, the ones at the top appear mathematically to have exceptionally high levels of average total return. But in reality, these are stocks that are have been pushed down in price, uh, which makes their valuation look that much more attractive. But they've been pushed down in price more, more likely than not because of broad concerns by the market about their fundamental uh, their from fundamental situation. Uh, for instance, right now, a lot of housing stocks are selling at PE ratios on a trailing PE ratio basis of that are in the single digits, the mid single digits, PEs of four, five, and six, 
long term, housing stocks have a, a very bullish outlook. But in the short term, it's likely that many housing companies are going to sell fewer homes this year than last year. And that trend may continue into the future. The macro trend, of course, is that housing, there's not enough housing in the US. So entry level homes are in demand. If consumers are pausing buying homes right now, that's something they're going to return to at a later date. But how can, how sure are you when that will happen? And are you patient enough to, to uh, hang on in the face of midterm or near term uh, uh, identifiable problems in a company's particular business? In other cases, you'll be looking at stocks in your portfolio or candidates, and you'll find they have historically high PE ratios as measured by their current PE to their average PE ratio. And those are great problems to have, and no one is going to be sympathetic to you when you complain about uh, how overvalued some of the stocks are in your portfolio. The truth is that the market loves success stories and investors love success stories. And so those stocks often get carried along uh, well in advance of their fundamentals for some time, those very high valuation levels. And NEIC, Better Investing's recommendation is it's often best to hold on to overvalued stocks during overvalued markets. But at other times, um, it can be very useful and uh, very much recommended to replace stocks when they reach those historically high valuation level levels. Um, and so overpriced stocks always should be treated with special care because they can, they can quickly turn on you. Uh, those high valuations might be uh, the peak before the fall, or they, uh, they might uh, continue to run uh, at those high valuations for many, many years. Uh, Stephen asks about Apple stock in the, in the questions box. And Apple is a great company that's not really driven by fundamentals so much as it is by investor sentiment. Uh, and they can have long periods where fundamentally they're not performing quite as well as their price would suggest and they can carry that high multiple for many years. Uh, I always think it's good to be prudent when you're buying Apple, but on the sell side, uh, uh, everyone who has uh, attended one of my portfolio review classes in the last decade or two, uh, where I've talked about the need to prune overweighted holdings, has sold Apple stock and regretted it. So it is a, a tricky case, and that's why I think I, I, I say that uh, we can carry those companies at excessively high valuations for some time in spite of their fundamental performance. On the other hand, we've got stocks that are too cheap. Um, and these are those stocks that rank highest for projected total return in your current portfolio or when you're screening. Uh, but it, what's important to keep in mind is that however discounted these stocks are, if you don't know what's happening to those companies in the broader marketplace, then you're likely to get burned. Even um, uh, a stock that has uh, an excessively low relative value, which we decide, decide, uh, define as lo less than 80 percent. Um, are not especially good values. They're usually more of a sign that the company's facing some serious fundamental problems. This is the case on the uh, SSG Plus portfolio uh, review report that flags stocks that have a relative value or projected real, but relative value below 80% or more than 150%. Uh, anything between 80 and 150% is considered relatively normal. Above 150%, that's considered nosebleed valuation territory. Um, and below 80% doesn't necessarily equate to a, quote, cheap stock uh, as much as a stock that is unwanted and undesired. Better investing suggests that you focus on the fundamentals before turning to those valuation issues. And I like to think of valuation on this, uh, on that, um, uh, that scale between 80 and 150%. Uh, now we're talking about stocks at the higher end of it. And I refer to stocks that have PE uh, relative value or projected relative value, PEs that are more than 150% of their average uh, PE ratio as hypervalued. 
they're not merely overvalued, they're hypervalued. And those stocks can be damaging to your overall returns because they carry with them so much downside risk relative to the very limited upside risk. So in other words, the best performer in your stock portfolio may have the worst projected total return because you were brilliant when you bought it at just the right price. And over the course of a few years, it's gone up eight, seven, 11 times in price. Uh, now you're sitting on large capital gains. You're very happy with this with the uh, situation, but the downside might be considerable if the price has ex well exceeded uh, the fundamental growth of earnings over time. So I mentioned it's good to hold overvalued stocks during periods of high market valuation. If we're in the throes and passion of a bull market, those stocks can hold on to their value at any time. But the problem is when the bear market arrives, you're not gonna get an invitation. You're not gonna know when it's coming, and those stocks could be the biggest leaders on a percentage basis uh, in very short, uh, a very short period if the rest of the market uh, takes a big correction. So my strategy for dealing with stocks that have been identified as hypervalued is to consider using trailing stop loss orders. And now I don't have time tonight to go into details of using TSL lows, but I can give you some basics and you can do some more research uh, to understand how you might utilize them in your own portfolio. A TSLO uh, is a type of order you place at the broker that will allow your, any stock to continue a run-up in price, but will trigger if the price starts to retreat a certain percentage be, uh, uh, below uh, the, the highest price the stock has reached since you set the, uh, the TSLO. Typically, they're in the 5 to 8% range, um, but you can review the 52-week price chart and figure out, you know, what's the biggest drop in a short period, the period of a week or, or so? What's the biggest percentage drop that stock has experienced? That might give you some guidance uh, for that particular approach. Uh, now, a stock price in a TSLO can be set in two ways. It can be set as a percentage of current price, which is my preference or as a fixed dollar amount less the current price. So you could say, well, as the uh, my $100 stock, I will set a 10% um, uh, stop price. So when you set it, if the uh, price of the stock is $100 and it's a 10% uh, stock, if the price falls to $90, then the uh, the stock would be triggered for sale or the, per the percentage of shares and number of shares that you placed in the order. As that uh, stock goes up, the, the uh, stop follows the stock price, um, and then, but if the stock price drops, the stop doesn't change, and so uh, the stop will be triggered if it reaches that, um, uh, that stop price, that newly set stop price. So this is a way of ensuring that you're going to hold on to most of the gains in those hypervalued stocks uh, if there is a sudden reversal of fortune of the market and, or of that particular stock. Here's an example from TD Ameritrade, uh, and you can see the green graph on the top is the stock's price. It's going up, it's going down. Uh, the red line is the stop. That goes up. When the price goes up, it stays flat. When the price goes down, and then at the um, on the right side, you see the stock price decline. It intersects the stop price and the shares are sold. Uh, in this example, of course, it's a brokerage firm that's convincing you that this is a good idea. So the example equity price continues to decline after your shares have sold. Here in the real world, uh, you've gotta be prepared with a number of outcomes. One of which is this one, that the stock, uh, stop, uh, the stock has continued to decline. Uh, another situation, however, might be the stock continues to go up. And so you have to be prepared to give up some potential gains. So when you're using TSLOs, only use them on stocks for which you'll be happy to trigger capital grains, gains. And I know that no one's happy to trigger capital gains, but you have to be, accept that uh, once you set that stop loss, that the shares could be sold 
uh, and uh, you have to be happy with that exit from that position because there's no guarantee that you're going to get it exactly right. The stock won't resume its upward climb as soon as your order is your sell order is filled. But if the stock, uh, the price of the stock continues to fall after the sale, you can consider repurchasing. If you sold the stocks at a gain, you could. There's no wash sale, so you could repurchase right away at uh, at a lower price. So there can be win wins any way that you look at the particular situation. So that's the hyper valuation um, uh, mode of dealing, uh, or the the using TSLs to deal with hyper valuation issues. And there's another way that we can address stocks that we're uncertain about in our portfolio. Uh, NEIC's founder George Nicholson advised investors to allocate five percent, perhaps a little bit more, of your investable assets towards speculative opportunities. Um, we call this ring fencing. You're building a fence around this portion of your portfolio. Uh, and uh, his objective here was to help you identify uh, and not let that speculative for portion of your investments grow to be 40% of your portfolio. That's not sound, uh, but it allows you to take advantage of opportunities for companies that maybe don't fit the better investing model uh, or in opportunities for emerging companies that don't have an earnings, uh, earnings or revenues just yet, but yet for which you have done some research and have some insight. Uh, by ring fencing your portfolio in this way, if the picks work out, the returns can be significant. His position was that those speculative opportunities can offer you, deliver uh, you know, 100, 200% returns when they work out. Uh, but the downside risk is always limited to 100% of your investment when you're investing in stocks. So uh, this is another way that we can work towards levels of uncertainty. So we've got a stock you're holding. It, it doesn't seem to be working out. You're not ready to throw in the towel just yet. It's in the maybe zone. Maybe you direct this portion towards your ring, fest, ring fenced speculative uh, portion of your portfolio, that investment. And once you've done that, you know, the, the weight lifts from your shoulders. This is the play money, the mad money section. If it works out, that's great. Uh, I'm not worried about it. It's part of a core portion of my holdings that I'm gonna, it's gonna allow me to retire. It's there. Um, and uh, it, it's separated from everything else. It won't contaminate my well-constructed portfolio. So that can be another approach. And I have no problem with this concept of uh, set creating a speculative uh, per portfolio in a club or in your individual uh, uh, in, in your individual portfolio. So let me take a look at some of the questions here, uh, and uh, we'll uh, keep moving along. As uh, we see any of the questions. Um, the first one I see, Doug, um, Stephen said he missed United Healthcare and Netflix because he didn't see the future potential. Have you developed a checklist to aid in that evaluation? Well, one of my current biggest holdings or biggest performers right now is Netflix because I bought it on the dip. Uh, and uh, it was merely uh, a case of looking at their business. Um, uh, there was a shift in terms of their revenue, where what the revenue mix was coming from, but it seemed too good an opportunity at that uh, when it sold, it started to sell off a couple, two years ago now. Uh, so I started uh, putting some uh, money towards Netflix and it's performed very well. Uh, you know, as always, uh, I like a good, a good, uh, a good, um, a good story, but I back it up with the research. And I certainly wouldn't bet against, you know, when we talk about, uh, Apple and Amazon and Google uh, and Netflix and Meta, you know, the, the, the what they're calling now the Magnificent Seven. Um, often many of those companies can be held um, regardless of the, the, the near-term fundamental factors because of the superiority of their businesses and what they do. Uh, and it's very different. 
uh, from dealing with smaller companies as I do on a day-to-day -day basis in the small cap and form or reviewing those smaller companies and coming up with, with the aspects of what makes a, a good business. But when you look at, um, uh, for instance, Netflix is a great example. When you look at Netflix's uh, competitors, you know, we've got a lot of businesses like Comcast and like Disney that are trying to compete, that are trying to get into that space um, and are losing a whole lot of money while they're doing it, while net Netflix is profitable. And I think that at the bottom line, pursuant to the stock selection guide, kind of tells you much of what you need to know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Earlier, you talked about um, the... Est um now I can't even think of it. The trailing stop loss uh, orders, TSOs. Um, yes. Someone is asking, can you also touch on stop versus stop limit? Well, most TSLOs are going to be limit orders. So when the stop price is uh, reached, then uh, they will be uh, executed at or below that limit. Um, price, that stop price, uh, but they can be also be set as market orders. Um, and a stop, uh, uh, you know, your traditional brokerage stop price is just, uh, you just enter the price. If the stock, if the, if the stock falls below, um, you know, it's trading at $300. If it falls below $280, sell it. Well, the problem is that those orders uh, don't that that price doesn't change even though the fundamentals might change um, usually those stops uh, stop orders are reset when dividends are paid for instance uh, but you could be going that stop could be in effect for uh, a very long time or while a stock has gone up significantly in price if you hadn't adjusted that that three hundred dollar stock is now six hundred dollars and your stop is still 280 and the the stock falls from six hundred dollars to uh, you know uh, three hundred and ninety dollars very quickly, as which can happen. Uh, you would have wished that you had adjusted your your stop price. So that's the difference between a stop order and a trailing stop loss order. Uh, okay. So the trailing aspect is the important part of it. Right. Um, someone asked, do you still like air lease? I think air lease is. Uh, in a difficult business is an excellent company um, and they have been uh, performing uh, very well in recent quarters. The Investor Advisory Service reiterated its recommendation earlier this year based on the strength and the outlook of the business. So uh, I'm still very optimistic about their longer term potential. In the short term, uh, we might see another couple of quarters but all of their leases, for instance, have interest rate riders. So uh, as their cost of capital goes up, uh, their airline customers are going to pay for that, and that actually, you know, that's a uh, will w that by itself will generate better results for the company. Uh, and I still think all the drivers in the aircraft leasing business uh, are still in place that will benefit air lease, such as the trend for airlines to uh, to not buy their own planes, but lease planes, uh, and the trend towards more fuel efficient planes with uh, better amenities um, and better features that customers are looking for right now. So those factors are still just as strong as ever for, the, for air lease. Okay. Um, you mentioned Magnificent Seven. Um, can you give what is the Magnificent Seven? Can you mention it again? Uh, yeah, those the Magnificent Seven is the the current term for the the uh, the seven biggest stocks in the um, uh, in the uh, you know the S and P five hundred, the big multi mega cap uh, multinational companies. It used to be the Fang stocks, and then it was the Fang stocks, and uh, so those uh, are the, the the seven drivers of the market. And we'll talk a little bit more about Apple uh, in just a couple of minutes. Okay, I think I have one more question. Uh, how long? A stop, how long should a stop loss stay in effect? Uh, the, the Robert thought it was about 30 days. Yeah, um, uh, you'll have to check on a brokerage by brokerage basis what their policies are. Generally, when a dividend is paid, all the uh, all the stop orders are are, um, are immediately canceled. 
Uh, and uh, there may be other instances in which those orders have to be reset. Uh, so uh, again, we're not going to give you a tutorial tonight on using trailing stop loss orders, but do check with your broker if that's something that you might be interested in. Okay. And you might want to think about this one a bit um, if you have time. Can you talk a bit about position sizing and port portfolio risk management? Uh, <laughs> I certainly can, and I certainly have thoughts on it. I don't know if we'll have a chance to get to that tonight when we're dealing in the uh, maybe zone, but certainly the basics of portfolio management and um, uh, allocation, portfolio allocation, diversification that Better Investing teaches are a great place to start with that. Well, let's continue now with escaping from maybe zone stocks. Um, in particular, the problem of selling. Sell is a four-letter word, and I like to think of it in terms of something that we shouldn't be discussing in polite society. Uh, I think we should strike the word sell from our vocabulary as investors because it is, it is problematic for a number of reasons and it affects our decision-making process uh, when we decide to sell something. It stokes feelings of inadequacy and regret in our decisions when we have to admit failure in a stock that we've selected and we have to, we're, we feel like we're forced to sell it. We have to reach that decision. It's very difficult. On the other hand, if we talk about replacing stocks in our portfolio or upgrading our portfolio by replacing this holding with another holding that's got better return and quality metrics, then it makes that decision so much easier. Your portfolio can always be upgraded. Wouldn't you want an upgrade for your portfolio if it was offered to you, if there was one decision that you could make to replace one stock with another that would raise the average return potential of your portfolio that would increase the average quality metric of measurement of your portfolio so if we think about those maybe zone stocks the stocks that you're not sure what to do with and we think about replacing them in our portfolio we've we've now shifted this entire discussion to something that's about finding what's better for our portfolio instead of focusing on what we've lost. And one way that I like to do this is another concept that I developed about marking stocks in your portfolio available for cash. I use the, the, the abbreviation AFC. And this is useful in a club because you might uh, take some of these concepts back to your club and everyone agrees, yeah, this we don't really want this stock and that stock in the portfolio anymore. We've been resisted to sell it, but now what do we do? Well, as a precursor to making that decision about replacing that stock, you can simply say, let's all agree that if we find a better candidate, this stock is going to be converted to cash to make that purchase. So we make a little mark on the valuation statement, circle that stock and write AFC next to it. And we can do this virtually. You can do this uh, on, on your, your literal club statement or your portfolio report if you want. This is really key to the group to think group decision-making process because it gets everybody on board with, first of all, the notion that we need to find a replacement. And then second of all, what's that replacement going to be? And it might be a meeting or two down the road before you find the ideal candidate that serves your portfolio needs, your diversification targets, and allows you to go, okay, now it's time to convert this stock into cash to make this purchase. And this also is great for the cognitive biases that investors uh, often experience. It replaces that feeling of sadness and regret when we sell an underperformer from our portfolio or the uncertainty that comes when we sell a stock that's performed very well because now we feel like we're losing something by getting rid of this stock um, and, and simply recording a profit. It feels like a betrayal of the relationship, emotionally speaking. So by um, um, tr coupling that uh, sell with the buy of a new stock. And if you think about when, whenever you buy a new company, you get a, 
a jolt of adrenaline. You, the endorphins kick in. You, now you're, this could be the eight bagger um, that would take the club from average performance to superstar performance. This could be the stock that you bring to the club or that you introduce to your portfolio that shaves years off your retirement target date. Right? It's all a matter of potential when you click that buy button. So we, we have all these positive feelings and those positive feelings make it easier to push the negative feelings further into the background by joining the two together. So the that available for cash concept, that replacement concept, put them together and it can make for more productive uh, portfolio management decisions. So I understand that what I hear about as I speak to chapters and clubs and investors around the country, often people want to know, what about this stock? What about that stock? And they're asking because they're uncertain. They're, and that's natural. But ask yourself, if you're holding on to a stock and you want to, you're constantly wondering, what should I do about it? Well, that means you're holding on to uncertainty in your portfolio. You're hoping that things will turn around. You're uh, you're, you're hoping that a better idea might turn up. You're hoping for a sign to come down from, from Benjamin Graham up in heaven above to say, now it's time to sell or Warren Buffett to send you a telegram and say, better get rid of that. These are signs that are not going to happen. You're going to have to make that decision. So thinking about stocks as a candidate for replacement instead of selling outright and then you're embarked, you have a new quest. You're going to search for candidates to replace that stock. And when you find the most compelling candidates, they're going to give you all the rationale you need to take action and to replace those underperformers in your portfolio. Throughout this entire process, I want to emphasize there's a little room for your gut feelings in investing. The exception might be in that speculative for portion of your portfolio. We're backing up our decisions with research, with our understanding and our investigation into an industry and a company and its com competition. And the stock selection guide is the shortcut to allow you to conduct research and to, to find the most important factors that contribute to a stock's long-term success. They're all on the stock selection guide. So if you can't justify the stock purchase decision or sell decision based on the research on the tools at your disposal, don't jump to action. If you find an opportunity for a stock and you're not sure about it, you have a course of action. Put it on your watch list. You don't have a watch list. Your next task is to create a watch list and then you've got a repository for ideas uh, as they come in. Uh, you'll wait for information to be re revealed and if there are opportunities that are lost, don't worry about it. There's always going to be more opportunities. Um, the Investor Advisory Service newsletter is 50 years old this uh, this year. Started in 1973. Every issue uh, until last month, they uh, recommended three stocks in the issue. This is through the worst of the bear markets in the 1970s, the historic bull markets of the 1990s, uh, the uh, various wars and international conflicts and uh, uh, recessions along the way. There was never a month where they said, sorry, I couldn't find anything for you this month. No, there were always stocks to be found. And I just point that out because uh, you, there are always stocks out there. The trick is finding them, and that's a skill that you'll need to develop over time. So don't don't feel forlorn about stocks that you hold. What we don't want to do is sell, make a lot of sell decisions, sit on a lot of cash that then you have to to go out and find a use for. Sitting on cash in your portfolio uh, from the better investing uh, orthodoxy is ineffective, ineffectual, uh, and will guarantee that your returns are going to be lower than if you were fully invested in the market. So there were always all sorts of uh, opportunities there. So let me summarize now my strategies uh, for coping with uncertainty. So first of all, build in a margin of safety with each of your buy decisions and in the construction of your overall portfolio. It's okay to dip your toe into stocks that might be uh, might be on the cusp of the buy zone, but try as much as possible to make sure that you're you, that you are investing at the right price in high quality companies. 
if you come across stocks in your portfolio that have a are in the in the maybe zone you've identified them as being solidly in the maybe zone put them on probation and then have a defined plan for hold, handling them in the small cap informer the defined plan is we're going to be watching over the next two three four quarters for these for these uh for these stocks to understand what's going on and at some point there we're going to have to make a decision. The investor advisory service analysts, uh, the um, the the advisors from Provident Investment, um, Scott Horsberg once said that they look at three quarters of deteriorating performance is enough to get them kicked out of IAS. Um, I'm looking in the small cap informer often at emerging companies that don't have as much history for which we expect a little more volatility. I tend to give them a little more leeway sometimes, perhaps not when I should, and I tend to hold on to them longer as a result, perhaps longer than I should, uh, but the on probation strategy is, uh, is trying to combat that uh, by putting stocks into that segregated area. For those hyper-valued stocks in your portfolio, um, capture future upside, uh, but protect yourself on the downside using trailing stop loss orders. If you've got questionable stocks that are not on probation, um, that are perhaps overvalued, but not hypervalued, um, or if they're on the borderline and you're not ready to get, you're actively want to continue holding them, consider moving them into the speculative portion of your portfolio and then mark uncertain companies available for cash and seek replacements. So I've got four portfolio baskets that I've outlined for you. The hyper-valued basket, right? These, these are not portfolios. These are just labels that we apply to our holdings. Hyper-valued basket, stocks that are in the excessive valuation excessive valuation range available for cash stocks these are the stocks that require replacing um, there should be more than you know a couple of these in your portfolio at any point in time on probation stocks you're not buying more of them you're not selling them until you learn more about their business and their outlook and speculative stocks that carry some long-term potential despite an acknowledged higher level of risk and with that, uh, we'll wrap it up with some questions, perhaps, and then uh, we'd love to tie it up for the evening. Bobby, are there any additional questions? I am double checking right now. Uh, I went through just a moment ago, and I think they were all answered. Um, if anybody else can see something that's unanswered, speak up, please. Everybody wishes your presentation was in person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I will be. Uh, I will be. Um, uh, I will be traveling uh, this fall. I'll be at the at, uh, the Georgia Chapters Investor Fair on August uh, 19th, I believe, in Atlanta. So, if you're in the greater Atlanta area, I'll be at the uh, Money Show. In fact, in uh, Orlando at the end of October as well. Um, so the, we are starting up again with some live events, and of course, I would love to see people there. Um, I've left in the handout here at the end uh, information about our newsletters, if you're not familiar, familiar with them. I'm very proud of our performance for both of the newsletters, uh, the Investor Advisory Service um, and the Small Cap Informer. I've left you some price charts. Of course, these show a, show both the newsletters in an excellent light compared to their benchmarks. Um, both of them have performed very well year to date during the last one to, to three years. Um, so we, we've got some good, strong performance there uh, based on long-term uh, long uh, 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 periods of time. And uh, there is a promo code that I've been authorized uh, by my boss, who's Ken Zendel, the CEO of Better Investing. Uh, you can use the promo code Doug's Deal to save on a subscription or renewal um, uh, if you want to try either of the newsletters. And uh, here is information about the Money Show in Orlando. This is our first first uh, trip back to the Money Show live event since uh, very early. Uh, I think January of 2020 was the last yeah. time we were there. So uh, going on almost four years later, uh, but we right. will be back at the Omni Orlando Resort at Champions Gate uh, on October 29th, 31th. We'll have a booth in the exhibit hall uh, and uh, you can of course join us there. Um, do you remember the one question, Doug, about the portfolio management and the sizing uh, question? Um, 
I answered the gentleman by telling him to perhaps uh, do a frequently asked questions search on uh, Stock Central website and on my iClub website. I know there's lots of videos there that you discuss various topics. Uh, I'm not sure if that was the correct place to have him go. If not, do you have other resources that he might uh, check out to get some more information? Uh, yeah, we've certainly on uh, YouTube, on the iClub Central channel there, iClub Central, all one word, uh, that is our collection of investment club um, uh, webinars. And we have definitely done webinars on portfolio construction for uh, investment clubs. And those principles are by and large also relevant to individual investors. So I would urge you to, to start there, look at the investment club webinars, um, and uh, you can search for portfolio management, portfolio building, um, and uh, you will turn up some of our presentations that we've done there. Good, okay. I don't see, I do not see any more questions that have not been answered already. Well, thank you, Bobby, and thank you to all of you for attending tonight. Uh, we're, I'm so pleased to have been able to be with you tonight, and we'll look forward at maybe seeing you at another uh, online event uh, with Better Investing at some point in the future. Thank you so much, Doug.